I'm going to tell you a story. It starts a few months ago with an article that came out in a very prestigious journal called Science. A group of neuroscientists got together to map one cubic millimetre of human brain tissue. To do this, they used fancy microscopes to image the cells and the scaffolding within the tissue down to incredible resolution. And then they used artificial intelligence to put these images back together to visualize these microscopic structures in 3D. The reconstructed image took up 1.4 petabytes of data. That's 1.4 million gigabytes, or just shy of 11,000 iPhones for the younger ones. <laughs> this is for a piece of tissue, brain tissue, the size of a grain of sand. If they want to get the whole brain, they'll have to do that a million more times. This tiny piece of tissue contained 57,000 cells with tendrils that extended through space to connect with other cells in a dense mesh of intertwined neural connections. We were able to see for the first time how vast and varied these connections are. While most pairs of cells only shared one or two connections, some cells connected with each other more than 50 times. Some cells formed symmetrical pairs where they seemed to be the mirror image of each other. Some cells wrapped around themselves and formed knots. Within this dense microscopic world, there were 150,000 tiny junctions between the cell connections that allow the transmission of molecules from one cell to another. This transfer of molecules is how cells in the brain talk to each other. This is what allows us to breathe and keep our heart beating, but also to move, to observe the world around us to speak and understand language. In fact, this transfer of molecules is what underpins our thoughts, our emotions, our sensations, our very personalities. And different molecules do different things. A molecule called serotonin is important for our general emotions, and a molecule called oxytocin is important for the specific emotions of love and parent-child bonding. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about a molecule called dopamine. Dopamine regulates how we learn about actions that are rewarding. When we get a reward, there's a surge of dopamine release in the brain, and it strengthens the cell connections and reinforces whatever action we just took, making us more likely to repeat it again. And if we repeat it enough times, the action itself starts to cause that surge of dopamine, and ultimately, it becomes a habit. Habits are deeply ingrained patterns of behavior, and they're really important. They save us enormous mental load, but they do open us up to vulnerabilities. We all know habits are hard to break. That's because they're automatic. They're not part of an active decision-making process. And some habits can kill us. Drug addiction takes the lives of four Australians every day. All drugs you can get addicted to have one thing in common. They cause an enormous surge of dopamine release in the brain. Something about this surge of dopamine combined with complex social factors and other vulnerabilities leads to addictions, which are super habits that seem to override even the most serious consequences. We need better treatment for drug addiction. And to get that, we need to understand how dopamine works. That's the focus of my research. I've found that when we engage in goal-directed actions, those are actions that are deliberate and purposeful, dopamine has its most powerful effects in a specific circuit of the brain, which is distinct from the dopamine circuit that takes over when we engage in habits. This switch in dopamine circuits is key to how we change between goal-directed actions and habits in our everyday life. And something about this normal balance is lost in addictions. Now we can use this new information to find better treatments. What we look for in a treatment for drug addiction is something that reduces cravings and reduces rates of relapse. From what I've told you, targeting dopamine in this habit circuit in the brain seems to be the most direct way to do this. 
The problem is that medications that alter dopamine do so throughout the whole brain, not just in targeted circuits. However, there are other more targeted ways to affect dopamine. Deep brain stimulation involves electrodes that are surgically implanted into the brain to regulate dopamine levels in a targeted region. Now, brain surgery sounds extreme and invasive, <laughs> but there are a few things to keep in mind. This treatment's actually been used successfully for Parkinson's disease for over 40 years. So we actually know it's quite safe. But also, all treatments need to be viewed in the context of the severity of the disease that they're treating. In the case of addictions, deep brain stimulation would be a last defense option when other treatment options have failed. This is for people who are potentially at a fatal stage of disease. Offering another treatment option could very possibly be life-saving. And the evidence is so far that it works. Early patient trials show that when all other treatments have failed, deep brain stimulation significantly reduces relapse rates for people suffering from addictions. So this offers new hope, but it's only the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. In the past decade, we've built a powerful inventory of new tools that will revolutionize our treatment approaches. I'm inspired by the fact that our microscopes are now so powerful that we can visualize human tissue with nanometer resolution down to individual synaptic connections. But we don't just look, we can change the way the brain works. We can alter brain activity using lights. We can deliver medications using ultrasounds. We can literally change our DNA. But we do this stuff in the lab, not in the clinic. And right now, there's a big gap between the types of treatments that are available in the clinic and the types of treatments that are possible from what we can do in the lab. That gap is going to get smaller. So my message from this story is this. We are still at the very start of our path to treating diseases. But these treatments don't start at the hospital. They start under the microscope. They start with one millimeter of brain. They start with the most fundamental basic properties of how cells look, how they work, how they communicate. Today, I've given you one example of how science into the basic processes of biology can deliver very real outcomes for medicine. These same processes can lead to discoveries that help society, the environment, education, the economy, and we are living in a time that will see multiple breakthroughs in our ability to treat a range of diseases. And that is something to get excited about. Thank you.